I'll kind of introduce myself really quickly. Um, I'm a lecturer here at GSA um, in the Design History and Theory Department, and I'm also a lecturer in Museum Studies at the University of Glasgow. Um, I'm Canadian, um, but I've lived in Glasgow for quite a long time, like on and off. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, I suppose, Canada's uh, connections or involvement or um, history within uh, climate colonialism. Um, but I do so speaking from the perspective of a settler, and I think that's really important to say just from the beginning. So I'm not um, taking up the position of an indigenous person. Um, I am a settler. My parents are English. They moved to Canada in the late 1970s, and I was born in Toronto. Um, Toronto is the historical lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, um, the Mississaugas of the New First Credit, and the Huron Wendat. Um, and indigenous people continue to inhabit the space that is the city of Toronto, which is the city that I grew up in. So I think that's kind of important to put out there right from the beginning. Um, also, I'm not a geographer. <laughs> I think that's important. I'm not a geographer, I'm not an environmental historian. Um, I'm definitely not a sustainability expert. I don't want to make any claims to be any of those things. Um, what I am <laughs> is a cultural historian, I suppose. Um, and my research kind of sits at the intersection between art and design history, post-colonial studies, and museum studies. In particular, my research and teaching examines the visual and material culture of the British Empire between the 18th and 20th centuries, as well as contemporary or present-day legacies of that past. Um, so I really I study images and I study objects, and I consider empire and its after effects through those images and objects. Um, I look at a dialogue between past and present, um, between a so-called colonial past and a so-called colonial present, and I look at the role that images and objects play in that uh, dialogue, I suppose. My current research focuses on the history of museums and exhibitions, um, the links between collecting museums and empire, and debates around institutional decolonization, um, and my teaching practices rooted in concepts of critical pedagogy. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, in like a really not in a fast way. Um, so when I was um, invited or asked if I would like to contribute to this evening's event on um, climate change and colonialism, climate colonialism, this was the thing that popped into my mind. This was the image, I work in images and objects, and this was the thing that came into my mind um, right immediately. Um, so what is this? What are we looking at here? This is a butter sculpture. Weird. Um, it's actually a black and white photograph, obviously, of a life-size uh, three-dimensional butter sculpture um, that was made entirely out of butter, about two and a half tons. Uh, and it's contained uh, within a huge refrigerated display case. So this is what we are looking at here. Um, this <laughs> bizarre object um, was conceived and made especially for the Canadian Pavilion at the British Empire Exhibition held in London in 1924. It depicts the Prince of Wales with his steed. Um, the Prince of Wales, who then became um, King, King Edward VIII before abdicating. Um, I think he was that guy. That's this guy. Um, and it depicts him on his ranch in southern Alberta in Canada. Um, what does this have to do with climate change and colonialism? Um, well, for me, this really outlandish display encapsulates the links between territorialization, colonial settlement, indigenous erasure, and resource extraction, all of which were intrinsic to the formation of Canada, one of the so-called white settler dominions. I'm using language that is, we associate with the 19th century, white settler dominion, that's of course a fallacy. Um, and those issues around territorialization and erasure and resource extraction were also intrinsic to the wider British imperial project. So not just Canada, but Canada is my lens here. Um, so in the remaining time that I have, I'm gonna try and tease out those connections. Um, and I'm also gonna demonstrate links between this historical event, this is a tiny snapshot here, um, a micro history, I suppose, and contemporary issues. I'm gonna try and trace a thread that connects past and present since, as Stuart Hall argues, and I'm quoting directly here, the present still carries the specters of the past hiding inside it. The one stands on the shoulders of the other. For Hall, this persistence constitutes an untranscended colonialism, um, 
which I think is a really, really useful concept. Um, so many Canadian historians were historians of Canada, which I am, um, both of those things, I suppose. Um, we agree that the kind of beginning of the 20th century um, was a really a period of heightened nationalism in Canada. There was a growing sense among Canadians of being Canadian um, and of having a national identity that was distinct and was specific. Um, notions of landscape were really integral to this budding sense of national identity. Imaginings of vast and supposedly empty and untouched wilderness were becoming key tropes of Canadian nationhood. A quinta quintessential illustration of this discourse is the work of the Group of Seven, um, a collection of largely Toronto-based painters who came to prominence in Canada in the 1920s and were hailed as the first kind of truly national school of Canadian artists. At the time, it was felt that the work of Tom Thompson, which is here, Lauren Harris, um, and Arthur Lismer, this is just to name a few, I'm not going to name all of them, seemed to capture the colors, the vibrancy, the ruggedness, the climate, the seasons, and crucially, I think, the emptiness of the Canadian landscape in a way that no artists before them had. It's important to stress that all of these paintings, oh, Lismer's and Thompson's, was an incredibly famous painting for Canadians. Else. <laughs> 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 uh, these works are in a, a real landscape. They, they're in Ontario, the province of Ontario. Um, and at the time that these paintings were created, <coughs> pretty dramatic deforestation was taking part in this part of Ontario, which of course we don't see in these paintings. I think that's kind of important to underline. Um, so these last three paintings, Lismer, Harris, and Thompson, um, were also shown at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924 and 1925. They were displayed in a different building to the butter sculpture, which I'm going to get back to. Um, but they similarly contributed to Canada's presence at this event, and just like the butter sculpture, attracted a huge amount of attention from both press and exhibition goers. Um, so we like hoo ha about this stuff. Um, Indeed, for British art critics, the fact that Canada was capable of producing artists of this caliber was a testament to how developed and civilized the Dominion had become. Again, I'm using these words are should be applied, but there's air quotes here. So the vision of the Canadian landscape that we see in this tableau um, is different to that given off by the paintings, whereas the paintings are devoid of people. So as viewers were presented with empty, unpopulated land, the butter sculpture does contain signs of habitation. It's a fairly realistic portrayal of the main house on Beddingfeld Ranch in Alberta, which the Prince of Wales had bought in 1919 when he was on a royal tour of North America. The story is that the Prince of Wales was so taken by Alberta's scenery, so this contrast um, between kind of flat prairies and then very, very dramatic mountainscapes, um, as well as the rancher cowboy lifestyle, that he bought a ranch on the spot, as one does. Um, under his direction, the ranch developed a breeding program for sheep, cattle, and horses with livestock that he imported from his farms in the Duchy of Cornwall in England to Alberta. This part of Alberta, so where his ranch was located, as well as the broader region, um, is this major cattle farming country. Um, it was then, and it remains to this day. This entails using the land for large-scale agricultural production, um, which as we now know, has a hugely harmful impact on local eco ecosystems and is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. If anyone wants to ask questions about these photographs in the discussion, please, please do. Um, it's important to highlight that the Prince's Ranch is within Treaty 7 territory. As this map shows, much of the land that makes up the nation state that we now know as Canada was acquired through the signing of treaties between the government of Canada and the First Nations. Treaty 7, which is well, the pink one on the left-hand side, was signed in September 1877 by Plains First Nations, five Plains First Nations, and federal government authorities. The Plains First Nations understood it to be primarily a peace treaty um, whereby they allowed settlement 
and promoted peaceful cohabitation um, in exchange for a series of promises from the Canadian government. None of the five First Nations thought that it was a land surrender, which the Canadian government definitely saw it as being. Um, so we have a real conflict of understandings of what this treaty entailed here. Um, indeed, in signing Treaty 7, the five Plains nations gave up their land rights and agreed to the creation of separate reserves or reservations. Divergent understandings of the treaty's purpose combined with significant cultural and linguistic barriers and what some have argued was perhaps a deliberate attempt on the part of Canadian government um, translators to deceive First Nations representatives. Um, all of that discrepancy um, has meant that Treaty 7 has been disputed um, and it's led to ongoing conflicts and claims ever since it was signed in the 1870s. So Treaty 7 territory remains to this day disputed territory. This is the land that is pictured in butter here. Um, but of course, none of this historical context was related to exhibition goers in the 1920s. Instead, the dominant message projected by this sculpture um, was of the abundance that awaited settlers. Abundance of land and space, abundance of natural resources and therefore of wealth, and an abundance of butter. Um, <laughs> There's actually deep symbolic meaning to butter. <laughs> the kind of undercurrent to that is that in this period, Britain was still going, going through an economic downturn after the First World War and Canada was very much selling itself as a place where you could come and you could own land, you could be wealthy, um, and you could eat butter as opposed to margarine. Mm -hmm. You could be healthier. You could be a more lively individual. Um, it seems daft, but it's actually, they're actually quite like pervasive ideologies in this thing. And I think we can also read a lot into the fact that it's butter, and butter's white, <laughs> right? Um, the taking of land from indigenous nations was regarded as a necessary step in the settlement and development of Canada. We're talking about very deliberate indigenous erasure here, and I really do mean deliberate. Um, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada concluded in its final report, which was published in 2015, policies and laws enacted by state and church authorities in Canada over centuries have led to the cultural genocide of indigenous peoples right across the country. So that was the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The images and objects that I've talked about, um, which were shown almost side by side at the British Empire Exhibition in the 1920s, reveal, reveal two very different visions of landscape. The paintings by Thompson and the Group of Seven portray empty landscapes, devoid of people, habitation, and industry, wilderness. The butter sculpture shows a developed and increasingly industrial landscape. In both cases, the land being portrayed had been, for centuries, used and was under the guardianship of sovereign indigenous nations. But over the course of the 19th and 20th century, these lands were systematically territorialized by Canadian colonial authorities. It was turned into the provinces that make up modern-day Canada and settled by non-indigenous people. So while they look very different, both examples show a, control and man a controlled and managed emptiness, the result of which has been the displacement of indigenous peoples and disregard for indigenous sovereignty and land rights. And the legacies, I'm obviously talking about a historical time period here, but the legacies of that are very much still with us. So the current policies of the Canadian government are still very much in that line, where there's a continuing disregard for um, indigenous sovereignty over land and favoring the rights of multinational corporations and corporate interests and sub interests. So I think I will leave it there. Uh, thank you very much.